Asian markets trade mixed in the absence of cues from Wall Street, which was shut on account of the Juneteenth holiday. The GIF Nifty is suggesting a marginally positive start for the Indian markets. Crude prices continue to hover around $85 a barrel. Gold, too, remains range-bound around $2350 an ounce. The upcoming GST Council meeting on Saturday could consider quashing retrospective tax demands for some sectors, including online gaming. Sources say that the Council could clarify on tax levy on telecom spectrum allotment and ESOPs provided by a company to its employees. The government hikes minimum support price for paddy by 5% for the 2023-24 Kharif season. Overall, MSP for 14 crops has been hiked by 21%. And the Ministry of Education cancels the University Grants Commission National Eligibility Test held on the 18th of June following prima facie indications that the integrity of the exam has been compromised. The matter has also been handed over to the CBI for a thorough investigation. Good morning. It's the penultimate trading day of the week and you're watching Power Breakfast here on CNBC TV 18 in the Mumbai News Centre. I am Hormas Patakia. Let's first take a look at how the Asian markets are faring this morning. It's a slightly negative start across the Asia-Pacific and that is also because of the lack of cues from Wall Street because the US markets were shut yesterday because of the Juneteenth holiday. The Taiwanese index is looking to hold on to those gains that it made yesterday. Remember, that index made a record high in yesterday's trading session, so still two-tenths of a percent higher. The Hang Seng is flat but is trading with a negative bias. Now, the Chinese stock markets have also dipped. That is because the People's Bank of China uh, kept their one-year loan prime uh, lending rate, which is the LPR rate, unchanged. And the one-year uh, medium-term lending facility was also kept steady. So, queues coming in from China with regards to the interest rates. But the Japanese indices are the ones that are underperforming today. Both the Nikkei and the Topics, the two indexes, uh, the indices there in Japan are trading with losses of close to a percent. So, it's a mixed to a negative start across the Asia Pacific pull up the gift nifty as well we see how that is shaping up right now it's flat it's indicating a sluggish start for our own markets remember we've had a prolonged period of outperformance as well over the last few trading sessions and saw some profit booking yesterday at higher levels now the gift nifty the implied open suggesting a slight 20 point uptick for our own markets but Wall Street was shut yesterday, but futures are trading marginally higher this morning. And as I mentioned, they were shut because of the Juneteenth holiday. Now, let's listen in to David Zervos, who's talking about the key policy differences between Trump and Biden and what they mean for the U.S. markets. How the big differences between Trump and Biden are on regulatory policy that, yeah. you know, their trade policies, they're really not that different. Fiscal and monetary are going to be more driven by Congress than the president. And um, immigration policies are different, but they just don't move the needle the same way uh, they would in, in many other countries that are more open. So why would we be talking about major uh, trade policy differences? I think they've been quite similar, and they will likely be quite similar whether or not Biden or Trump wins. The market is looking for key differences in policy. The key difference in policy, the number one difference, will really be deregulation versus regulation. When it comes to fiscal policy, they're both pretty fiscally profligate. Now, Wednesday was a mixed day of trade for the European markets, with the French CAC slipping about 60 points, the German DAX also falling a similar quantum, while the British FTSE closed about 14 points higher. Now, inflation in the UK returned to the 2% mark for the first time in nearly three years. Investors will also watch the Bank of England decision, which is expected later this evening. Now, this will be the last Bank of England decision before the national elections in the UK, which will take place in the month of July. CNBC's Arabile Gumed gets us the details from London. An inflation print that the Bank of England will be happy with because it means that the hard work that they've put in to try and raise interest rates in order to bring inflation back down towards their own target of 2% has finally achieved its goal. But what about the hood? What happens underneath the surface? And that is the key question mark here because inflation on the headline figure has hit 2%. But here are the mixed signals then. You have a traffic light that I'm right under right now, and it kind of gives you a clear sense of how difficult things have been 
for the Bank of England. Because on the one hand, inflation may have returned to target, but on the other hand, you still have services inflation, which has been a worry for the Bank of England, still sitting close to 6%. It's now hit 5.7%. The market had been looking for a figure of 5.5%. You also have wage inflation, which is still too sticky and still too high. So perhaps not enough evidence then for the Bank of England to cut interest rates, particularly at its July meeting. But what happens in future? Perhaps then they can do so. Before this CPI report, you had inflation expectations and the market also anticipating that you would get uh, interest rates coming down. And that was by 63 economists out of 65 who thought that inflation and as well as uh, interest rates would actually drop off by 25 basis points in the August meeting. But that has now dropped off ever so slightly. In fact, you're having more of the market anticipating a rate cut in September with more anticipated as well for December. Both political parties, the Conservatives as well as the Labour Party, have made comments with regards to this, with Labour Party saying that while they have returned the, the inflation rate back to target, all the work that has been done over the last two years has meant then that prices have increased around 20%, which is in fact true. On the other side, Rishi Sunak has also made note of how they have fought against prices continuing to rise and have brought that target range, uh, the target of inflation back into call, meaning that things are a little bit easier. Whether it will hold true, whether it will hold any significance for voters is yet to be known, of course, this being the last inflation print before the UK heads to the polls. But the Bank of England not anticipated then to cut interest rates in its July meeting. And all eyes will be on the Bank of England later this evening on their policy decision. But that's all we have on the global market action. But how will all of these overnight queues impact our own markets? We have our research team joining in with how the trade setup looks like and the stocks that are likely to be in the news. First up, Vamakshi is joining in to get us all the market queues we need to watch out for today. Vamakshi, good morning. We saw a bit of profit booking from higher levels yesterday. What's the setup looking like today? Well, absolutely, Hormaz, we did see that. But let me first start off with the US markets. They were closed, uh, so there are mo no major queues coming in from there. As far as the European markets are concerned, the stocks uh, 600 index uh, closed with cuts of nearly two, uh, two tenths of a percent. But coming back to our own Indian markets, yes, it was a, uh, quite a volatile day uh, for the Indian markets. We saw India week spike by almost 5.77%. Uh, in fact, all four frontline indices hit a record high intraday, but it was a mixed close as far as the Indian markets are concerned. Uh, let's first look at Nifty. Nifty uh, managed to open on, uh, on a strong footing, but after that, uh, it sort of mellowed down and then towards closing, it managed to hit an all-time high again after cooling off uh, again from uh, the all-time high. So Nifty closed with uh, cuts of around 42 points uh, and in fact, with that, it snapped its five-day gain Street. The Nifty Bank, however, was the index that actually stole the show. Uh, it was up nearly 1.9% on its expiry day. The likes of Axis Bank and HDFC banks uh, saw an uptick of almost 3%, while ICICI Bank and Indusin Bank were up nearly 2%. The broader markets, which were outperforming the benchmark indices so far, saw some bit of profit booking. Nifty mid cap ended nearly 1% lower, while Nifty small cap ended nearly half a percent lower. That was it for uh, what the Indian markets looked like yesterday. But coming to today, uh, on the global front, we will be watching out for Bank of England's rate decision. Uh, the expectation for today is that trading could la largely be subdued. It could be range-bound, but one cannot rule out volatility given, the, uh, given that it's the expiry day. Sector rotation as well as stock-specific action is expected to continue. As far as particular stocks are concerned, watch out for Bharti Airtel, Vodafone Idea, Reliance, uh, April Telecom data is out. PNB Housing will also be in focus. And lastly, keep an eye out on some rural focus names as well uh, because the RBI is suggesting that uh, monsoon pro early landfall is expected to bode well for agriculture and the union cabinet has approved MSP for 14 crops for the Kharif period. As of now, Gif Nifty is indicating a muted start. You did start in need, Vamashi. Thanks a lot for joining in and sharing with us all the cues we need to watch out for today. Over to Upasna now who would list out the stocks that you need to watch out for in today's session. Upasna, good morning. 
morning. First up, let me start with Sun Pharma. The company's Dadra facility receives a warning letter from US FDA. Next up is PNB Housing. According to sources, Asia Opportunities Fund, General Atlantic is likely to sell 4.2% stake in the company and floor price is seen around 7,773 per share with a maximum 8% discount likely to the current market price. And deal size is nearly around 830 crores. Mass Financial will also be in focus as 400 crore QIP opens. That's the an upside of another 100 crores in terms of its QIP and the floor price is seen at 301.3 per share. Next up is TTK Prestige. The management has appointed a global consultant to draw a blueprint for a five-year long-term strategy and plans to invest 12 crore over the next six months. KEI Industries will also be in focus as the co operations of the facility in Rakoli and Chinchpara plant are affected due to labor strike with effect from June 19, 2024. Brigade Enterprises will also be in focus as it signs agreement worth 150 crore to develop third tower of World Trade Center at Infopark Kochi. Next up is Sapphire Foods. The board approves stock split in the ratio of 5 is to 1. And BHEL will also be in focus as Rajkumar Devedi has been design designated as the CFO of the company with effect from 19th June. Gokulas Exports, that will also be in focus as company plans to invest in BRFL Textile Private Limited by subscribing through OCDs. And in the first tranche, the company will subscribe 50 crores, while the remaining uh, 300 crore optionally convertible debentures will be subscribed subs subsequently in multiple tranches. And lastly, telecom stocks will remain in focus as the da telecom data has been released. Re Reliance Geo adds 26.8 lakh subscribers, Bharti Airtel adds 7.5 lakh users and Vodafone Idea loses on the flip side with 7.35 lakh users. Upasana, thanks a lot for that. Now over to Nigel who is joining in with Qush from the FNO space. Nigel, good morning. The options expiry today. What's the setup looking like? Well, that's right. Uh, morning, Horvath. Uh, you know, in yesterday's trading session, uh, the Nifty Bank, that was a start in trade, but that came off the high point of the day. That was clearly the flag bearer for the bulls. What did the FIs do? Well, they added long positions, close to 43,000 long contracts is what they added, and they covered some shots as well. And now, the FIs are net long on the index. And for the first time in this series, well, you have the FIs that are now net long from being net short by close to 3.5 lakh contracts. Now they're net long. And the clients that actually have been getting it right, they have unwound all their long positions. And now, in fact, they are net short. So the client positioning as well should come up for you on the screen. From being net long by close to 3.3 lakh contracts, well, now they're mildly net short with uh, United around 43,000 contracts on. What about the options data? 23,600 call, 23,500 call. Well, both of them were fairly active in yesterday's trading session. There was a sense that there was writing at both those two levels. While on the downside, the 23,300 put, well, that saw a fair bit of action, which brings us to the levels. On the Nifty and the Nifty Bank, the question is, yesterday, did we make a near-term peak? You know, because we came off uh, decisively from those highs that we saw in yesterday's trading session. So that's going to be important. On the downside, you'll have to say buy on dip still continues. The level you're looking at on the downside for the Nifty will be 23,200. And on the Nifty Bank will be around 50,500. I say that because on the way up, that was a bit of a resistance. Stocks that I'm looking at, a couple of stocks came into the band. So your Chumble Fertilizer, HAL, as well as Indastars, they could be in focus because they have moved into the band. Well, a couple of them have come out of the ban after a while. Sun TV could be the stock to look at in today's trading session. That came out of the ban. And GNFC is another one as well. Back to you. What a change the series can bring, isn't it? From net short to net longs now at the FIs. Nigel, thanks a lot for that. Now, time for a short break here. Up next, we get your details on the agenda for the upcoming GST Council meeting on Saturday. Stay tuned back on the other side. Welcome back. Now, the GST Council meeting on this Saturday will be meeting for the first time since the Lok Sabha elections. Now, sources have said that the council is considering levying tax on spectrum allocations in the telecom sector alongside discussions to reduce taxes on supplies collected at source for e-commerce companies. Timzi Jaipuria joins us now. Timzi, take us through the issues on the council's agenda. 
Well, that's right. It seems to be a full plate for the GST Council, which is likely to meet on 22nd June. Sources say that the Council is likely to clarify on issues with respect to GST levy on spectrum allotment to telecom companies. Council could say that GST levy on payment of license fee, spectrum usage charges applies on the due date or the payment date, whichever is earlier. And in case of installment payments or deferred payments, GST should be discharged accordingly. Similarly, a clarity is likely for the highway builders. Sources say that under the hybrid annuity model, a builder is liable to pay GST at the issue of invoice or payment receipt, whichever is earlier. In case there is an interest component on installments or the annuity payable by NHAI to the builder, even that will be taxable. Council is also likely to issue clarification on a plethora of issues, including taxability of reimbursement of shares as ESOPs, also providing clarity uh, on the corporate guarantee provided by related persons. Also, a clarity is uh, awaited on REC and salvage values in motor insurance claims. Clarity is likely to be extended on whether uh, there is a clear decision on extended warranty provided by manufacturers to the end consumer. Several proposals of the insurance sector, such as supply between uh, lead insurance and co-insurer, on transaction of seeding commission between insurer and reinsurer, the council is also likely to reduce the rate of TCS collected by e-commerce operators for supplies made through them from present 1% to 0.5% and a lot more. Let's see what all does the council take up when it meets on June 22nd. Timzi, thanks a lot for that update. Now, top economists met Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman and Ministry officials ahead of the union budget. Sources have said that discussions centred on sustaining growth, long-term investments, and the government was also urged to maintain the fiscal deficit target at 5.1% for next year. Shivani Bazaz has the details for us. Shivani. Well, the finance minister met with top economists of the country ahead of the upcoming budget to discuss the state of Indian economy and also the important issues impacting the growth uh, of the economy. Now, sources tell CNBC TV 18 that the meeting uh, focused on sustaining growth, long-term investments and also addressing inconsistencies uh, in the Indian economy. What we are given to understand is that uh, key issues included policy continuity on four fronts, which is rural development, women's empowerment, uh, support uh, to the farmers and youth youth programs. These are the four focus areas of the government uh, right now. Now, the economists emphasized uh, maintaining the fiscal deficit target of 5.1% next year as well. Now, they also highlighted uh, that the need to sustain growth momentum, increase capital expenditure and also boost private sector investments uh, in the Indian economy. Now, uh, another point that we are given to understand is that strengthening consumption growth and domestic manufacturing were also on the agenda. Importantly, job creation was under score as a priority for the new budget. Shivani, thanks a lot for that update. Now time for a short break. Up next, we get you cues from the commodity space. Stay tuned back on the other side. Back with us here on Power Breakfast and Manisha Gupta now joins in with cues from the commodity space. Manisha, good morning. Some revival in copper, I guess. Oh, well, yes, it's trading at a two-month high. Uh, it's off the two-month lows, rather, and we've seen smart gains come into the prices. Well, for this year, it's 15% higher year-to-date, but the prices did hit a low of 9,550. Currently, we're trading at 9,780. All-time high has been at 11,000 that we hit in the month of May. So the last one month actually has been choppy for many of these metals. But the metals also are digesting the fact that the China today has kept the lending rates unchanged on expected lines. Well, we have seen a lot of concern in the property sector, even after China has put out various stimulus measures, given subsidies. Even the government is buying unsold property projects there. Even after that, we haven't seen the numbers improve there. In case of copper, the support could be coming in from the fact that there are concerns on availability of ore, operational setbacks in Chile, and then China smelter output cuts as well. All of these factors will ensure that the prices stay above $9,500 a ton. 
But there is a strength that we've seen continuing in case of the crude oil prices. That one is trading at a seven-week highs. There are escalating tensions in Europe and Middle East. And then we also have the first tropical storm by the name of Alberto. This is the first named storm of 2024. And that has brought about coastal flooding around Gulf of Mexico. That also seems to be adding some premium. Interesting. But Manisha, stay on because the cabinet has approved an increase in MSP for 14 Kharif crops. Give us more details on that. Well, yes, uh, we did hear the government say that uh, rupees 2 lakh crores as MSP is what will go out in this year. So that's a huge number, almost 35,000 crores more than what we had in the last season there. Well, the higher prices will encourage farmers to sow more. And on expected lines, Armas, we have seen higher MSPs go out in case of pulses there. So anywhere between 6 to 8 percent of an increase in MSP is what we've seen in pulses. Also, when you look at the core cereals or even millets for that reason, you are looking at 5 to 12 percent of an increase in these as well. So, unexpected lines really. Uh, paddy and uh, edible oils have a lower increase in MSP, a modest 4 to 5 percent. But when it comes to pulses and millets and core cereals, we are looking at higher MSP increase here. Thanks a lot, Manisha, for that update on the commodity space as well as the MSP increase. But amid the NEET fiasco, the Education Ministry has announced the cancellation of the UGC NET exam that was held two days ago. Parikshit is now joining in with the details. Parikshit, what are you picking up? Well, uh, this indeed is uh, unprecedented and uh, puts a lot of uncertainty uh, in place for candidates who had sat for these examinations. So 11 lakh candidates had sat for the UGC net exam on the 18th of June and within about 24 to 30 hours, this entire examination has been cancelled. So why was this cancelled? Because the uh, Ministry of Home Affairs Cybercrime Coordination Centre sent some alerts to the UGC saying that the integrity of this exam may have been compromised. Uh, which also raises questions about a possible paper leak for that matter. Now, because of these circumstances, uh, the entire examination has been cancelled and it will be held again. Now, wh what is the UGC net exam? It is actually for candidates who want to take up teaching jobs. It's a postgraduate exam for students who want to take up teaching jobs in future. So this was for about 11 lakh candidates. Simultaneously, you've got the NEAT issue which has been going on in the Supreme Court. Now, NEAT is a eligibility come entrance test for students wanting to take up medical education or admission in medical colleges across the country. 24 lakh students had taken the NEET exam in the first week of May and uh, there are petitions in the Supreme Court questioning uh, why there have been irregularities, why there are 67 students who scored a perfect score of 720. How is that even possible? It's unprecedented in NEET's history. Uh, regarding those uh, allegations, the centre has been defending its track record. But what they have done now, they have said that the, CB, uh, that the uh, Bihar police is investigating this case uh, when it comes to irregularities in Bihar. Uh, and we will take further notice and further action once uh, things become clearer, in the case of NET, the matter has been handed over to the CBI. Parikshit, thanks a lot for that update there. But moving on, a day after the US government filed a lawsuit against Adobe, the company's chairman and CEO, Shantanu Narain, spoke exclusively to CNBC TV18. He termed the US government's case as misguided and promised to fight it in court. Speaking to Shireen Bhan at the Adobe headquarters, Narayan said that the world has entered the era of artificial intelligence and acknowledged that it will be disruptive, while also adding that AI can be a massive enabler and a tailwind. Well, first, I'm really proud of what our team has done. When you think about the content authenticity initiative, something that we pioneered over 3,000 companies have now signed up with it. While people understand that AI has all this power, I think it's fair to say there's some heightened sensitivity around yeah. what does this mean to me? Mm. And so, you know, that I wouldn't call it a trust deficit as much as questions mm. about what that is. And a company like Adobe has a leadership role uh, that we need to play, not just for ourselves with our customers, but for the industry at large about our terms of use. Yeah. I think there were some questions and legally everybody who looked at that understood that, you know, it, the content belongs to them. We're not training our models based on that. But I think perhaps in English we could have done a simpler job of clarifying it. So, which, which we have. And so, you know, we've rolled it out. We are creator friendly.
I think the product innovation that we're delivering, Shireen, it always you know, warms your heart when you look at the amount of innovation that we're delivering. And I think we've talked about this in the past. AI is going to be this incredibly uh, enabling technology that allows us to you know, target a broader set of customers. And so I guess it's the era of AI. Now we can create campaigns, we can create content, we can address the content supply chain. So I, I'm completely convinced that AI, while I acknowledge it'll be disruptive, at the end of the day, it's going to be a massive enabler and a tailwind. And that's all we have on this edition of Power Breakfast from me and the team that put this show together. Thank you so much for watching. Bazaar Morning Call takes the action forward.